protection. And now for our feature presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? You're listening to Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. Call in to join the conversation at 646 668 8393. Welcome to Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. It's the six man Dean Geronimo in the studio with Mark Lee. And we welcome you to yet another exciting episode of our show. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome again to another Monday night. It is the 18th of March, 2019. Spring is two days away. But it's the six man Dean Geronimo. And as always, from NJ to NC, I'm in the studio with my man, my right-hand man, Mark Lee. So, Mark, tell me what's good in your neck of the woods, my brother. Well, you know, a lot's going on in this neck of the woods. We got a uh, women's event that we do every year at the Hay Tide. It'll be coming up on this coming Saturday. And then my good friend, Renee uh, Nixon, she's got a play called uh, Worried, and she's done a revamp version of it, so it's Worried. 2.0, 2.0, and she'll be uh, doing that play after the women's uh, event. The women's event is a combination of a variety of things. It's poets, it's dance, it's just a real celebration of women in the community, and um, I've done that have been a number of times, and I can tell you it's definitely worth checking out. And this past Saturday, yeah, you know your boy Desan, he was at it again. He was having his regular poetry slam, and this time he brought in some musicians, brought in a, a poet out of, I believe, Florida, who was a real powerful uh poet and everything so uh they were definitely rocking it had the band playing they don't always have a band with the poetry slam but they had a band had a couple of vendors including a brother that i'm gonna try to see if i can't get him on the show because uh he's a uh guy that does that new orleans style cooking and he gave me some of that uh I believe it was some jambalaya he gave me and i was definitely enjoying it so uh he knows what he's doing he's the man is definitely on top of his a game so uh i'm gonna tell you if i can't find his card and if we can't get him on the show and then, of course, you know, everything's going on in the world. I was glad to see that uh, a lot of teams that I am good friends of or have a tie to in one form or another, they did make the dance. You know, Duke and Carolina will be number one seeds representing different parts of the country. Virginia will also be a number one seed. So the ACC has got three teams that will be number one seeds. But, you know, some of the smaller colleges made it as well. Gardner-Webb will be in the house in the dance, as will... Um, North Carolina Central. Now, there's a possibility that we might have a battle of Durham. Now, you know, when they play in football, it's usually a slaughter. It'll probably be a slaughter in basketball as well. But there is a possibility <laughs> that if Lavelle Moten can pull it off, that win in the play-in game, which will be taking place, I believe, on Wednesday, and they'll be playing North Dakota State. There is a possibility that he could be going up against Duke. So these schools that are only about maybe four or five miles apart from each other could be facing each other in the round of 64 because like I said you know we're at the 68 teams but they got those four teams that uh, play uh, to get into the 64 um, and uh, there is a possibility that once we get down to the actual 64 um, and actually I guess it's 18 teams that are playing to cut it down to uh, one, now that I think about it it might be 18 that are playing to knock it down to the 64 yeah that would make sense because we got 18 and that's 68 then you get it up to the winners then you're at 64 so, uh, but those teams, so if Central can pull it off, they might be playing against their, uh, we'll call them their big brothers, just out of the road and everything. So that should be really interesting. I'm hoping that if that happens, one of the things that they bring out is the fact that one of the godfathers of Central was also very much involved with just the founding of basketball, that being Mr. McClendon. Because, you know, Mr. McClendon was a disciple of, from what I understand, of Mr. Naismith, who uh, was of course, the man that they credit for um, founding basketball and things of that nature. So uh, I'm hoping that they bring that tie up. And who knows, they may bring up the great, uh, the hidden game as well. So there was a game. Now, given it was, uh, I believe, graduate students from Duke that played Central in the hidden game. But that game was way back in the history books, and they made movies about it and things of that nature. So hopefully, if nothing else, some of that history will come out, and we'll find that out going on. So 
I was glad to see that my Marquette Warriors made it as well. So, you know, well, that's what I call them. We still go by the old name, but they are now the Golden Eagles and have been the Golden Eagles for a while. But those of us that are old school, we still like to call them the Marquette Warriors, and we like that warrior spirit that they have when they play in those games. Because no matter when they're down, they were even down, and I did not like the refs in that Big East semifinals game. I don't know what they were smoking, making all them crazy calls, but uh, they kicked out our two best defensive players and then said, wait a minute, the star of Seton Hall, you're out of the game, and then they let them back in the game. So I'm still confused about all that stuff. But wow. uh, like I said, basketball is all kinds of full of interesting things that go on, but we did not make it into the finals. We were there in the uh, semis and everything, but did not make it to the finals, and I thought there were some questionable calls, but uh, hey, that's just the way things roll sometimes. You just go with it, but we did make the dance. We're a five seed, and I'm a little worried because we're playing Murray State, and Murray State is one of those schools kind of like uh, Gonzaga historically, even though Gonzaga is the number one seed now, but back before they became that force, and some of the other schools that you know, you just kind of worry about them. BCU is another one. They get that low seed in the bid, but they just have a habit of knocking off folks, so I, I'm hoping my boys bring their A game because I do know that Murray State is a dangerous team, so I'm hoping they bring their A game so that we can make it to the next round. It'll be interesting and it, to see, and um, you know, so folks are ready for the knockoffs, the upsets, and everything that comes with March Madness. You know what I mean? So my question to you is: Are you going to do a pool? Because I do a pool every year. Sometimes I do them online. Definitely one of my jobs. Am I? does one. I don't remember if I did one last year, but I know I did one at least several of the years, and I'll probably have another one uh, in the uh, pool madness as well. Like I said, I think the closest I've come is maybe making it to uh, maybe making it out of the first round and still having a shot, but usually by the second and the third, that's when them upsets come down, and I'm out of the picture, but uh, maybe this will be my year. So, are you going to do one? That's my question to you, Dean. I mean, I do it for fun. I don't plan on winning anything from it. So, you know, but if you ask me, I would like to see. Uh, he goes by one name. He is Zion and those Duke Blue Devils. You know, I, I, I say Coach K gets another one. So, It's quite possible. It's quite possible that another one could be coming to Durham. And like I said, they may start their journey off by pummeling their boys right here from their own hometown or they might have mercy on them they might let them you know stay in the game for the first half just because you know it's that hometown kind of thing and I believe that a lot of those kids the kids from Carolina the kids from Duke and even the kids from Central they oftentimes wind up playing each other in pickup games because they're all in the same neighborhood even the kids from state so you know I'm sure that there'll be some uh folks that might know each other from just the playgrounds and everything right here in the area oh I think I heard the oh, bell yeah. but before we get to that before we get to that bell, I hope that's Melissa on the line. Now, the other thing I was talking to you, and I just want to make this real quick comment, is, you know, our boy, the president, was at it again. And no, I'm not claiming him. I still am not claiming him. But on Sunday, he sent out 29 tweets and retweets, which in and of itself, they say, is a remarkable thing to say about the chief executive of the United States. As a matter of fact, the guy that wrote this article, he says he is a prolific tweeter and retweeter himself, and he only sent out 15 tweets. I mean, I don't even. Say, I know I only say that maybe I'm lucky one or two in uh, during the course of uh, a day or everything, and some of those are retweets from Instagram and things of that nature. So I'm nowhere near what these guys are talking about, 15 and 29. But I do try to get the word out about what we're doing here and other things. And Twitter is a form, but they said that it wasn't just the sheer quality of what he said, but also what he said in them. And this, among the summary of things he said, he said the SEC and or the FEC, so maybe he was confused. He said the Federal Communication Commission or the Federal Election Commission should investigate whether the Saturday Night Live and late night talk shows are in collusion with Democrats and or Russia because they attack him so consistently. I don't know if he knows what I know, but I've been watching that. (laughs) In other words, he's tweeting nothing. He's tweeting nothing. (laughs) because I've been watching those kind of shows for years. And that's generally what they do no matter who's in office. They kind of like that's kind of the job of a comedian is to kind of like talk a lot of shunk about society and even the president as well. So that's did that had nothing. Then he attacked late Senator John McCain for allegedly sending the FBI the Steele dossier before the election and working with Democrats to do so. 
Also, Trump called McCain, who it's worth noting is dead, last in his class at the U.S. Naval Academy. So he's over here screwing somebody that's already dead, and now he's urging Fox News Channel to reinstate Janine Perro after she was suspended for questioning the patriotism of Democratic Representative Elon Omar of Minnesota, who is Muslim. So that's just some of the things that he's been putting out there. A lot of nonsense, it sounds like. So he's been, um, he also alleged that Democrats tried to steal a presidential election, calling it the biggest scandal in the history of our country. I think he might be the biggest scandal in the history of our country, but yeah, he just had a lot of nutty things to say and things that made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Well, like the old folks used to say, worthless people do worthless things. But we go get into some worthwhile conversation in just one second. Bass players, best thing you can do for your overall sound. You've got to see this. New Bass Tone Incorporated makes Nightwalker bass guitar tube preamps. This preamp will give your sound such a boost. It's just incredible. Try it today. Try it today now. A great sounding bass guitar will make for a great sounding band. Make your band sound at its best. Best thing you can do for your bass guitar sound. Newbasstone.com. Newbasstone.com. All right. It's, it's good evening. Thank you for calling Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. Who's on the line? Tell us where you're from. Melissa Harville LeBron, and I'm straight out of New York. How are you right. doing, Good Melissa? We're so glad to have you on this show. We're so glad that you are representing the New York area. Now, one of the things that I just found amazing about you is the fact that, um, and I'm just curious as to how you decided to get into this, because last week we had um, T. Naomi Lucas on who decided to form a uh, liquor company, and, of course, she acknowledges that even the liquor companies came out of uh, the whole, there was a tie between liquor and NASCAR and things of that nature. But you, as far as I know, the first sister to own your own NASCAR company. So I want to know what made you decide that you wanted a NASCAR company of all things? Well, I'm not the very first. There are co-owners. I'm the first sole owner to own a NASCAR team. And what made you decide to get into this? I understand that you were a uh, single mother at the time that you decided to do this, and I understand that that might have been part of the reason that you got into it is because uh, <laughs> you, you were – that's what I read. I read that you were somehow – they might have been interested. Maybe they were racing cars. I don't know what they were doing. But what about your kids got you to like the fact that you wanted to join and buy a team, basically? <laughs> so my journey was long getting to NASCAR. My background is originally in the entertainment industry, and I was asked to do an artist development deal on an aspiring singer that had some interest in coming into NASCAR. And I developed, they were having some issues with NASCAR with marketing, and I developed a 15 page marketing degree. And this basically, I just applied what I had learned in the music industry. Um, we took a meeting with the executive team in, Ma- in NASCAR, um, the president of diversity, their lead general counsel, and the vice president of operations. And they did love my marketing plan, but we weren't able to continue with the driver. But the entire time that I was working on this project and learning what I could about it, my two sons, Eric and Aniko, who the team is named after, they were in the background consuming every single thing that they could about NASCAR. And it's like I would come home from my office and they were like the first at the door to tell me, you know, what was the new stat and what they had learned. And they're very close in age, so they're highly competitive. So it was like this back and forth thing, like who knew more about the sport? And then we got invited to a NASCAR experience. And I said, you know, this is an opportunity to show them that there's more to the sport than just, you know, playing some video games in the comfort of their own home. And I've always been one to encourage the boys. And at the time, they were both recovering from injuries that they had sustained in sports. Eric had a level three concussion, and Aniko had torn his ACL. So, of course, you know, being a doting mom, you know, and always wanting to support, you know, I had seen that sparkle come back in them, and I hadn't seen anything that they were excited about in quite some time after their injuries. So when we got to the NASCAR experience, I'm, the again, the doting mom running back and forth with the video camera and the cell phone, and I tripped into a NASCAR official that was there giving a tour. 
So, of course, I don't look like the landscape, <laughs> and um, he wanted to know exactly what I was doing there. So, I, you know, I proceeded to tell him that, you know, I was there for my two sons, 